I want no blood on my hands. I want no blood on my hands. Ezekiel 3, please. Will you go there? Ezekiel 3. Third chapter, I want you to begin with me on verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou gavest, givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand." Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. Heavenly Father, this is a trembling word. It's a shocking word. And it causes me, Lord, to tremble in your presence. And we have to be honest about it and deal with this message. These words from the prophet Ezekiel, O oh God, Take my words, drive them into our heart, Lord, so deeply that we'll never forget them. Lord, what is our responsibility in this wicked city of New York to warn? What is our responsibility to warn our families and those on the job? What is our responsibility so that we can stand before you without blood on our hands? Lord Jesus, we've read this many times and we've just skipped over it. We can't skip over it anymore. We're going to face it head on this afternoon. Deal with us in love, but make it real. Drive it deep into our spirits. Lord, anoint me. Let me hear it from the Spirit and speak it from the Spirit. And Lord, may it be an impact on me and everyone who hears. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want no blood on my hands. I told you this scripture causes me to literally tremble physically, spiritually, emotionally. I tremble when I read this. I've read it many times, but this time the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me go any further till I faced it. Now the Holy Spirit <clears throat> comes upon a godly praying man, a prophet. He had been a priest, and God moved him into the role of a prophet by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he warns this godly, holy man that it was possible for him to go into eternity with blood on his hands. That's how blunt it is. That's how clear it is. There's no mistaking what God said to this prophet. He said, Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a, a challenge. I'm going to give you a warning. He said, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning for me. And then he was told, if you will not warn the wicked, to warn them of their wicked ways, to save his life, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That must have been the most shocking word that Ezekiel ever heard in his life from God. The possibility of going into eternity facing God with blood on his hands. Also, he was told, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I'll lay a stumbling block before him. In other words, God never causes anybody to sin. But the Bible says that very thing that the righteous man won't let go, and he continues in it, even after the plodding, prodding and the pleading of the Holy Spirit, it will rise up right in his face and be a lie that he can't deal with. And it's going to cause him to turn aside from his righteousness. He shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. But his blood will I require from your hand, on your hand. Think of that. Not only the wicked, but the righteous who turn away from their righteousness and turn to iniquity and die in their sins. If I don't warn them, if you don't warn them, God said to this prophet, 
I'm going to require their blood on your hands. The only way you can deliver your soul, he was told, from blood guiltiness is to warn the sinners to repent, go to the backslider and the rebellious believers to turn back from their wicked way. Now, folks, I take that seriously because God makes it clear in his word that every shepherd has been called to be a watchman. Every teacher, every evangelist, every Sunday school teacher, you're called to be a watchman. Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I'm a watchman. As a pastor, I'm a watchman. When I, I speak to our vast mailing list, I speak as an evangelist and prophet. And, and, and the, the Lord makes it very, very clear. I have to give an account. Everyone must give an account. I'm a watchman. Every pastor, every evangelist, every teacher, everyone is called by the name of the Lord. We are watchmen set on the wall. And we must give an account. They watch for your souls and they must give an account. Now, these words cannot be avoided. When I go to the judgment seat of Christ, I have to give an account of everything I've preached in this pulpit. I have to stand there and answer. I have to answer for those wicked ones that came in here. I have to answer for all the righteous that are here in this congregation. I have to answer as this Pastor Carter and those who minister to you. We have to give an account. Those who've turned away from their righteousness. I'm obligated by the Spirit of the living God in His Word to warn you. To preach conviction upon you. To hold your sin to your face before it become a stumbling block and you die in your sin. If this be so, I wonder how many preachers are going to be responsible for Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches, and the majority of those churches that stood before, that are going to stand before the judgment. How many preachers are going to have blood on their hands for those who lost their first love? How many... Pastors are going to be responsible for those who were holding false doctrines, who allowed Jezebels to teach, who allowed fornicators in God's house, who told God's people they were alive when actually they were dead, telling people that good works would save them. And those pastors who produced lukewarm believers, letting them believe that they needed nothing when in truth they were blind and and wretched and miserable and spiritually blind. How many pastors are responsible for Laodicean condition in the church? The, people, the prophets had scathing words, scathing words for shepherds who would not preach against sin, would not warn the people in their time. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. For the pastors have become brutish, mean stupid and blind. They've not been seeking the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and their flocks shall be scattered. Jeremiah cried out, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors, saith the Lord. Now some are going to recoil against the thing that I present to you right now, this truth. You say that's the D. That's the law. That's the Old Testament. We are under the day of grace. It's not possible that this day of grace that ministers of the gospel and shepherds and teachers can have blood on their hands at the judgment day for a lack of warning the wicked and the righteous about their sins. But let me show you something. Look at how the apostles, after the cross... In the full blaze of the day of grace. Look how seriously they took their challenge and their call. After the cross, Peter stands up. To, this is after Pentecost. After Jesus died in the day of grace. He cries out to the crowd, Save yourself from this wicked, crooked generation. 
He pointed his finger at them and he said, You have crucified both the Lord and the Christ. You crucified him. Flee from this crooked generation. Repent and get right with God. He took that challenge. He would have no blood on his hands. How seriously do you think Peter took his calling when a husband and wife in the first Pentecostal church in Jerusalem lied to the Holy Ghost? He didn't gloss over it. He didn't say, well, they're just new converts. He called them before the whole congregation. And he said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Because Peter was not going to have blood on his hands when he stood before his Christ on Judgment Day. He said, you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And they both dropped dead, teaching every church generation to follow that God means what he says. How seriously do you think Stephen took his challenge, the challenge of Christ, to preach truth to those of his generation? He looked at the crowd of priests and Pharisees and scribes and elders, all of them in rebellion, all of them living in sin. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Stiff-necked. Stephen knew he's going to pay with his life. But when he stands before his Christ, on that day of an account, a day when he gives account, he said, I have no blood on my hands. He told the truth at the cost of his life. You're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised in heart. You're hard-hearted. And you'll crucify the Son of the living God. You've crucified the Son of the living God. Paul the Apostle would have no blood on his hands when he discovered incest and fornication in the Corinthian church. He sent them a letter. He said, you Christians in Corinth, he's addressed them, you've been puffed up. You've not mourned because of this deed. You did not deal with this man. I urge you to purge out the old leaven. Deliver such a one unto Satan. Do not associate with fornicators. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Paul says, when I stand before my Christ, when I stand before God, I'll have no blood on my hands. I have warned you. I've kept the faith. I've fought a good fight. I have warned you. You see, a true man of God who loves his people is not a pal to his congregation. He doesn't come just to be flattered. Better to be wild up by your pastors. Better to run out of this church angry but convicted than have a pastor get up and flatter you into hell to appease your sin and make you feel that everything is okay. In Ezekiel chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit entering into Ezekiel. He's just been given this, this mandate. He's preparing to go and speak this message of judgment. And God told Ezekiel, the people have transgressed. They've rebelled against me. They've become hard-hearted to my warnings. You shall speak my words to them. And whether they listen or reject my warnings, they will know a prophet has been among them. So don't be afraid of them. They're going to be hard, but I'm going to give you a forehead of granite. I'm going to make you your head harder than their hearts. So that when they come bang against you, you won't break. They're going to break. And he said, I'm going to make you a strong preacher. Nothing is going to hinder the word from going forth. They may not listen, but I'm going to make you a hard four-headed prophet that you will not break or bend. Now think of what God told Ezekiel to do. He said, I want you to fill your very heart and soul with this word that I've given you that judgment is coming. You see, the Chaldeans are going to come down and it's just a short while when the city is going to be evacuated and they're going to be taken away and they're going to be persecuted and they're going to be taken into captivity bound hand and foot. Judgment is coming. And God says, I want you to eat this message. I want it to be, I want you to be so full of it. 
And he's told that his congregation that he's called to preach to is going to clearly understand the word. He said, there'll be no confusion about it. In fact, he said, I'm going to give you a word that if you would take it to the heathen, even though they don't understand your language, they'd understand your spirit and they would interpret it and they would get it and they would repent. But you see, my people, he said, have become so hard. They've sat under my teaching so long, and I've warned them so many times, rising early, sending prophet after prophet. And under this teaching, under this preaching, they've grown hard. And he said, I'm going to send you to these people. He said, they, the heathen, would have hearkened unto thee, but my people will resist your word. Now, isn't there something he's telling them to go and preach the hardest message they've been called to preach? And he said, they're not going to listen to you. My people are not going to. Now, the heathen would. You've heard me. It's just a cliche. You've heard me say, some of you have heard enough gospel to save China. And I believe that with all my heart. That's what God's saying to the prophet. The heathen will listen, but my people won't listen. God help the church. God help us. If we do not have bold prophets in these last days with stone foreheads, God help us. If we have men who stand in the pulpit who are afraid of, to preach because of the fear of men, God help us if we don't have prophets who weep over the backslidings in God's house. God help us when we have preachers in the pulpit who have not heard the word of God. They borrow the messages from one another. They get it from a book, they get it from other sources, but they have no original clear word from God. The man who stands in the pulpit is not to be a man pleaser. He doesn't preach for money. He's not yearning to be loved and pampered. The man who preaches the mind of Christ, the mind of God, has been shut in with the Lord. He's heard the sound of the trumpet, and he will not cease to preach what God tells him to preach no matter what the cost is. I've had to make up my mind recently to, to warn people on our mailing list <clears throat> messages like the awful consequences of backsliding. I send out newsletters now to almost 800,000 people and I tremble because on judgment day I have to answer. I have to answer if I should at any moment God tell me to preach something so strong that half my mailing list goes or if all of the mailing list goes and our source of money dries up that came from that source. And God says you will preach what I tell you to preach in love out of brokenness because I have seen the judgments coming. I've seen the more than thousand fires burning here in the streets of New York. And God help the church if all we have left in our pulpits at this midnight hour are men who stroke their congregations, feeding them on the rubbish of pop psychology, telling them that they're going to paradise when actually many are going to hell. God help the church. If all we have in our pulpits now are mild-mannered shepherds who spare the flock the truth about the wages of sin, who tell the sinners, come to our church, we're here to please you, we're here to make you comfortable, we're he here to help you ease your way into the kingdom of God. No, you don't ease your way into the kingdom of God. You can't go softly into the kingdom of God. On judgment day, how many backslidden, damned people, churchgoers, so-called Christians, when they stand before the judgment and they know that they're lost and they know they're numbered among the wicked, how many are going to rise up against their pastors and their shepherds and they're going to shake an angry fist and say, Pastor, you were Mr. Nice Guy. You were all sweetness and mercy. You said you didn't want to offend me. You provided me and my family with aerobics and basketball and dance classes and social events and marriage counseling and child care. But you didn't talk about my lifestyle. You didn't talk about my sin. 
You were more asked, you were more interested in packing your pews than saving me out of hell. I had wickedness in me. You blinded me to my sin. Never once did you preach conviction to me. You only said, believe and be saved. You didn't talk about repentance and holiness and separation. Pastor Shepherd, you never warned me. And there'll be a cry to the throne of God. Oh, God, let my blood be on his hand. Well, but I don't know when in eternity the Lord wipes away tears. My own feeling is that it will come after the judgment. When we stand there at the judgment, even the believers who come with him to judge, I believe he's going to wipe away the tears probably at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't know. But I wonder how many tears I'm going to shed. How many tears, Pastor Carter, and those shepherds all of the United States who are true, godly shepherds have been shut in with God, preaching truth and reality and love and brokenness. How many of them are going to weep as they see their flock, those backslidden, those who heard and heard and heard and hardened their hearts? It won't be, I told you, I warned you, I pleaded with you, see? No, it won't be, I told you so. It'll be, oh my God, oh my Jesus, have mercy. I'll be there. I will be there. And those who sat under our preaching for months and years and still turned from their righteousness, hardened because being often reproved and hardened the heart, cut off without remedy. I don't think my tears will be shut off. Any true shepherd's tears will be shut off and probably till the marriage supper of the Lamb. When he wipes away all tears. As a pastor, I don't know how I could stand there. I don't know without his supernatural grace and strength to see those who've heard so much preaching, had so much reproof, and still hardened their hearts and continued. Now see, when it concerns the wicked outside the church, so I happen to pastor here in New York City, the proudest, largest, most probably one of the most wicked cities in America. And I live on the 30th floor, a block from here in the church. And I have a view of the city. And I want to tell you, I've spent hours and hours pacing the floor and looking out my windows and weeping over these buildings because I know that in just two or three of the buildings outside, there's probably 15, 20,000 in just some of these. Uh, I, I look over toward the the east, uh, the Hudson River there, and I see one complex that's got over 25,000 people in one complex, one housing complex. And I say, oh, God, in the greater me Metroplex area, that includes the, all the greater New York, New Jersey area, there's 17 million people, 17 million people. You look down to Wall Street and you see covetousness and greed. You look down at Greenwich Village and Soho and you see homosexuality flourishing on all sides, being flaunted. And you, you look at this city and hear of, on news and radio and uh, newspapers almost every day, the raping and the murder. You, you look out your window, you see kids coming out of school, teenagers angry and rebellious and cursing. And you see the wickedness and the vileness of this city. Folks, I don't ever want to come to the place where I get so used to this city and its commerce and its activity and its intensity that I lose this heart cry about the wickedness. And I look out and I cry, God, how do we reach the city? How do we warn? How am I going to stand before you? I don't want blood on my hands. And there's a tendency because I, I want to figure things out and I, I want to get a yellow pad and a pencil and start concocting ideas on how to reach the city. How do we get it out? Do, do we hit the streets? Do we uh, pass out literature warning the judgment is coming? God, show us how I cry and I weep. How do you reach Wall Street? How do you reach the theater district? 
How do you reach Harlem and Spanish Harlem? Son of man, I've made thee a watchman. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his, un his wicked ways to save his life. The same wicked one shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. Now, folks, this dilemma that, that our pastors face and I face, this is exactly the dilemma Ezekiel's in now. God tells him this, this awesome word, gives him this awesome word, and I'm sure he's sitting down and crying, Oh, God, I hear you. Now, how am I going to do it? Where do I start? Do I start like Jeremiah up and down the streets weeping? Do I write letters to the leaders? God, what do I do? If you're going to have me stand before you on the judgment, you're going to hold me responsible. Then how? And that's my heart cry, God, if I stand one day called to this city to warn of coming judgment and you're going to hold me accountable then you have to tell me how you have to tell the church how and in Ezekiel 3 21 and 22 as the prophets pondering these awesome challenges and no doubt wondering how he could ever fulfill it the Holy Spirit comes upon him the hand of God touches him and God gives him direction. And they were strange, strange directions. Look at me, folks. God tells this man, you're responsible to warn your generation. You're responsible for my house to warn all those who sit under your preaching. You're responsible to warn. And then suddenly God does a strange thing. Verse 21 Verse 22, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I rose and went forth into the plain. I went into the valley of the wilderness. Now look here, please. God said, before you say a word to the wicked or the backslider, let me tell you, and what this God is saying something very profound to us, as he was to Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, in yourself you have nothing to say. You have no warning. You've got no word. In fact, he goes on, you read the rest of the chapter, he says, I'm going to call, I'm, I'm going to shut your mouth, I'm going to cause your tongue to cleave to the roof of your mouth, so that you can't say anything in your own power, in your own strength. Because you'll go out there in human zeal and you'll do more damage than good. He said, I'm going to take you out into the plain. I'm going to get you all to myself. And when you spend time with me, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to show you my glory. And what the glory of God is, is the awesome, actual presence of Jesus Christ. He said, you're not going out until you're filled with me. You've got to be so full of God. And I'm going to have you so full of the word. I'm going to put every word in your mouth that you're to give to the people, both the wicked and the backslider. It's going to be a divine wisdom that I give to you. You'll do exactly what the Spirit of God tells you to do. Then he does something else. He, he, he gets him alone. Look at the, verse 23. Then I rose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there. And I fell on my face. All right. Are you ready to hear the word? We called this church to a 30-day prayer chain, round the clock. Many have signed up back there. We'd like to have at least 2,000 signed up. You're given a little card to put your name on. That's just to put your time on that, the time that you're going to pray to remind you so you can, you won't forget it. 
put it in your pocket or your purse. And we're going to do exactly what God told Ezekiel to do. He said, I want you to come away. I want you to get on your face. I'm going to reveal myself to you. And here is Ezekiel now. Ezekiel walks away. He said, it's not time yet. Yes, I've been told to warn. And I know there'll be blood on my hands. But the Holy Spirit has called me alone with God. Alone with the Lord to get the message. And when he's alone with God, he's so awed by the presence of the Lord, he falls on his face. Let me say something. Probably almost every street preacher in New York either attends here or has visited here. And I thank God for all the street preachers. But may I say something to you who preach on the streets? Let me tell you, if you are not shut in with God, if you're not a praying man or woman, and you have gone to the Lord and you're there every day on your face before God, and you're a praying man, you're a praying woman, and you have been filled with the presence of the Lord, you've laid on your face before God, weeping for the lost. If you haven't done that, if you have not been shut in your prayer closet, you're out there babbling on the streets. You mean nothing to God. Stay out there 24 hours a day preaching, but unless you've been on your face, unless you've got your word on your knees from heaven, you're babbling. You have nothing to say. I thank God for you. I thank God for all the street preachers. I tell you, I love every one of them. But you're just babbling unless you've come from his presence and heard the true word of God till your heart's been broken. You stand there weeping. And same with the pulpit standing here. I have been called as a pastor and I don't get my sermons, nor does Pastor Carter get their sermons from books. I go to God as the disciples did. And every time I go to prayer, I think of myself as a disciple with a basket. And Jesus, they're breaking the bread. And I come to him saying, Lord, there's nothing in my basket. There's nothing up here. I've got nothing in my intelligence. I've got nothing to say to this people. I have nothing. Lord, if I preach out of David Wilkerson's head, it's nothing but garbage. I don't have anything. Lord, you're the one who breaks the bread. You've got to fill my basket. Then you fill my basket. I'll go out and feed them. <laughs> then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me. And what did the Lord say? Now, you've been alone with me for a while. No, 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 no. Go on out now and warn. What's verse 24 say? Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, what? Go shut thyself in thy house. Why? He will seek me. Folks, we're going to seek God. I tell you, in 30 days, if you'll be diligent and if you will pray, here's what we're to pray about in this prayer chain. God, show me, show the pastors, show all of us together how to reach the city. Our homes and the church to warn the wicked and the backslider that Jesus is coming and get right with God. And give us, give us the spirit of Christ in which to do it. Give us the words from heaven. Give us out of the book. That's why I said if you're going to pray without reading this book. I mean, first of all, before you go pray, spend a half hour, 15 minutes to a half hour at least in the word. And then take these promises and, and the word to God and challenge him on them. Do you know God's going to hold you responsible for warning those on your job? But first, he's going to shut you alone. You will seek his face. Folks, this idea of having a prayer chain, we're not doing that just to, to be busy. This is not works. This was born of the Holy Spirit. God is saying, I established churches in the middle of cities like this. I established churches for a purpose. It's not just to keep the remnant clean. 
It's to be a testimony, a warning to the whole city. And I promise you, if you will seek his face diligently, he will tell you how. He will give you words when you pick up the phone to talk to unsaved loved ones. I'm saying that after 30 days, God ought to be moving on hearts everywhere to pick up their phones and call all over the world. We have over 100 nationalities here. Get on the phone and warn your loved ones. God said, I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb. Will you talk about dumb? It means speechless. I'll make you speechless. And shall not you shall not be to them a reproof. This is verse 26. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth. Thou shalt be dumb. And shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Listen to me, folks. We've got a multitude of self-appointed prophets running all over the United States saying, Thus saith the Lord. They claim to be speaking for God, but much of what they say is flattery. Some of it's just nonsense. Often the warnings are, are, and the prophecies are, are meanderings of the human mind. God has not spoken to them. They're just empty words. I, I get it from our mailing list. I, I get We get reams and reams of prophecies. And you try to go through it and they're just meanderings. They just go on and on. about Some of it is absolute nonsense. And they're saying, thus saith the Lord. God hath said, God said, God said. And my Bible tells me it's a dangerous thing to say God said when he didn't say it to you. God said, I'll judge you and your house. According to Jeremiah, it's a great sin to claim to speak for God when God hasn't spoken to you. God says, they speak lies. Jeremiah 23, they use their tongue saying, he saith. They prophesy false dreams. They cause my people to err by their lightness. Folks, whenever you see a man in the pulpit who tells jokes and just gets people to laugh all the time, you can tell he's a false prophet right away. They cause my people to err by their lightness, by their joking spirit. Yet I did not send them. They shall not profit the people at all. They have perverted the word of the living God. They are prophets of the deceit of their own hearts. I will punish that man and his house. Beloved, I don't want God to punish me or my house because I stand flippantly and say, Thus saith the Lord. We have people, when I lived in Texas, I, I had so many who called themselves prophets come, and if I didn't listen to them, they'd curse me. One man left his shoes outside my door to shake the dust off his feet. Why he's shaking the dust, he forgot his shoes. He sat in my office for an hour babbling about Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel. I didn't even know what he was talking about. He was rambling. And, and he had a whole following of people who said he's a great prophet. But that great prophet had a spirit of anger. He had a hatchet in his hand. Don't dare say, thus saith the Lord, unless God has spoken. And he only speaks to those who are shut in with him who bear his word. Folks, I'm not against God. I'm not against pastors. I got a letter this week from a, a dear pastor's wife, and she said, Dear Brother Dave, please quit criticizing our pastors. I'm a pastor's wife, and I've seen dedication from my dear husband for the past 34 years. We are both diligent in our devotion to God. My husband works 50, 60 hours a week. We do not have great results like you do. And we've often asked why, but we're doing our best. We need encouragement. Don't criticize the pastors. Let me tell you something. Any godly pastor who shut in with God, who hears the kind of preaching I'm preaching right now, will cry amen. They know who they are. 
they know who they are. They'll not be offended by it. They'll not be offended. When I hear a man of God preach thunder, when I hear him preach, I don't care how hard it is, I'll say amen if it rings true. I'll say amen even if it cuts me to the core of my heart because every time I hear a true word of God, I want it to deal with anything hidden in my life. I want it dealt with. <sighs> Hallelujah. But if they had stood in my counsel or if they had understood my mind and it caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. Do you understand what God is saying here? If he's a true shepherd, if he's a true prophet, he's going to warn you about your wicked ways. Listen to it again. But if they had stood in my counsel, if these prophets of these shepherds really had been hearing from me, they would have caused my people to hear my words. They would have turned them away from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. In other words, he said, those who speak for me turn my people away from sin. Now, a word to those believers who sit under our preaching. The words you hear that come from this pulpit are words that came from that secret closet. It came from shepherds who were shut in with God. I say that with all assurance. It was given to us when we were alone with God. We go to the Lord as one who is dumb. We go to the Lord as one whose tongue cleaves the roof of his mouth. And then we come out like this. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. God said, Only when I loose your tongue, only when you know that God has spoken, you've been alone with God, you've been into this holy word of his, and it's been a hammer that's broken your heart. And it's been the oil of gladness. The word begins to rise up in your heart. God says, I will tell you when to speak. I'll give you the words to speak. Folks, the Bible said we're not to cast our pearls before swine lest they turn and rend you. There comes a time when God will just say this is not the time or the place. Yes, we are responsible. We're responsible. But first of all, God says before and above all your other responsibilities, even this great challenge about blood guiltness. He said, above and beyond all that, if you'll just get along with me, if you will seek my face and humble yourself before me, I'll make you the kind of person. I'll give you the word that you need. And it'll flow out of you like living waters. And it'll be effective. The easiest thing for me to have done this afternoon was to get you all started to place this uh, burden on you, this burden of blood guiltiness. I could have placed this on you and say, hit the streets now. Go home and get on the phone. Call everybody you know. Grab a handful of tracks and witness to everybody up and down these streets immediately. Go out and do it. But if you don't have the true word of the Lord and the burden of the Holy Spirit, and the brokenness in the presence of Jesus. It's not going to have the effect. The Bible said these things are given to us in this example, upon us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. All of these things are given for our benefit, for our training. And I look at this as my training. I do know that when I sit down here, when I'm finished this message, I do know that over these past few years especially, over these eight, ten, eight, nine years we've been here, we have warned the wicked from this pulpit. I've warned all over the United States through books, literature. We've warned those that sit in this congregation to get rid of your rebellion, 
We've warned you against gossip and slander. We have warned you lovingly with tears and brokenness about holding grudges against people. And I'll tell you honestly, the greatest wickedness of anyone in this house today is not drugs, alcohol, promiscuous sex. The greatest sin in this house are those Christians who know better and keep grudges in their heart. And I tell you now face to face, I tell you face to face and warn you now, just is here because I will not have your blood on my hands. I'm telling you now, you're hardening your heart. If you have not by now humbled yourself before those around you and you still carry grudges and bitterness in your heart, you're almost beyond help. You've been warned and warned and warned. You know, the, you know what is the best thing to do? If you're not going to sit here and obey the Lord, go find somebody who's going to flatter you. Go find somebody that's going to back you up in your sins and let you do what you want to do. But I'm telling you, you won't do it in this church. God won't allow it. The Holy Ghost won't allow it. I'm not a dictator or anything else, but I, I want to deliver my soul. I want to know that I've delivered my soul. The Lord said, if you've warned, you've delivered your soul. Folks, we've done it in love. And sometimes you can sit under a message that sounds so hard, and yet that's the most loving message you'll ever hear because it's the love of God for our precious souls because He loves us so much. My father spanked me many times. I got a lot of spankings when I was a kid. And he'd come down across my backside and he'd quote scripture, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child and the rod will drive it far from him. But I thank God because that's why I stand here in this pulpit. My dad never once winked at my sins. And I'm telling you now, you have pastors in this pulpit who will not let you slip into hell. We will stand here and love you. We, folks, sometimes when we go to God, He comes to us with the bread of mercy, sometimes with grace, sometimes with love, but then He comes sometimes with warnings and woes. Sometimes He comes with message of judgment and crying out. And you can almost hear the gut cry of God Himself coming from your pastors. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I must tell you this. I believe the majority of people here hearing me now, the majority of you, have not turned away from your righteousness. You love God passionately with all your heart and you want to grow in the Lord. I thank God for you. And if that's you, you rejoice in what you hear right now. You say, thank God, Brother Dave. Don't be afraid, Brother Carter. Preach it. Listen. This man who walks with me preaches in tears. I've seen Brother Caesar preach in tears. I've seen all of our men, teachers, with brokenness because they care for your souls. So they must give an account. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Beloved, up in the balcony, here in the main floor. <clears throat> Do you know how you can tell you're walking in the right direction? It's because you allow the Holy Ghost to convict you. You don't shake it off. You don't say, that's not me. You say, oh God, turn the light on. Turn it on me. Turn the light of the Holy Ghost on me. Turn it, Lord. I want to be right before you. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart, you see, mo mostly the message this afternoon is aimed at preparing us for the next 
30 days of prayer. I want you to go back there. and Don't sign up back there unless the Holy Spirit's needing you to do that. But I'm calling you as his servant, as God called Ezekiel, to come away into the plain, go to your house. We're not going to be praying in the church. Those hours, you're not to come here to the church. You're to pray in your house. If Times Square Church is your home church, you say, Brother Wilson, this is my church. This is where I belong. I'm asking you to take this burden with us. You can't leave it with just the pastors and staff. You have to join us. And I want you to, we want you to pray like you've never prayed in your life. And we want you to take upon you the responsibility. I want you to, you can read this every day in Ezekiel 3. Just read that chapter every day until the Holy Ghost makes it very real to your heart. And you'll come out of this prayer time with the clear word of the Lord. He'll tell you who to call. So you're not responsible for the whole world. You're responsible for those that God points out to you, to those who are near you, to those God sends you to. And he'll send you. And he'll lead you. And would you pray that God give the word to the pastors? That every wicked person, every sinner that comes in here will be confronted lovingly about his sins and be genuinely saved and not just raise their hands and vote for Jesus? We don't want people voting for Jesus in this church. We want people to repent and cry out to God. Oh, God, what must I do to be saved? That's the kind of conviction we want to see in this house. Folks, if you've been coming to this church and you feel, hey, God's been blessing, you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. God's going to come with convicting power. He's drawing us as pastors closer to him. And I believe he's wanting to draw this whole congregation to him. You fellows at Timothy House and over at Sarah House, the girls, this is 30 days of prayer. We're going to pray, pound the gates of heaven. Hallelujah. So, oh God, give me your word. Open heaven to me. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love. Give me a love for lost souls. Heavenly Father, do that for us. Change this church. God, shake this church. Shake us. Lord, I want you to shake me as I've never been shaken. I want you to bend me like I've never been bent. I want you to put my face on the earth. Lord, I want every member of the staff to have their face in the dirt, so to speak, oh God, until we are so full of the message, so full of Christ, that you send us here, you send us there, you give us directions that come from God that will be backed up by the Holy Ghost. And it'll be effective because we're doing what God told us to do. His time and His way. Hallelujah. Lord, we'll accept the responsibility. We will warn the wicked. We will warn the backslider. But, oh God, we'll do it under the anointing. Under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And full of the Spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. If, if the Holy... This is the only thing I know. If the Holy Ghost spoke to you in any way, and you need... To repent of anything. Get out of your seat and come here right now. And I'll pray with you. Up in the balcony, go to either side. If the Holy Ghost, while I preach, and God spoke to you about something in your life. Or, or you say, Brother Wilkerson, I don't want a stumbling block. you got a stumbling block right in front of you. Lay that stumbling block down before God right now. If God spoke to your heart, you come up here and we'll pray. We want to see your family saved. We want to see your families healed. We want to see your marriages healed. We want to see God work and move. Folks, I'm not satisfied. Are you satisfied that what God's done? There's so much more he wants to do. We've just begun. Oh, God, help us to see that we've just begun. I want everybody came forward raise both hands. I want you to pray this with me right now. Oh, God, I need your help. Break me, Lord, and melt my heart. Let me not take it for granted. All the things you've done for me. I need your spirit, God, to help me pray and to seek you. Lord, turn me around. I laid down all my sins, all my prejudices, all my grudges. I want to be right with you, God. I want to be clean. Cleanse me, Jesus, and lay your hand upon me. Call me to prayer. And I'll follow you, Jesus. Now let me pray for you. God, everyone who has their hands raised now, 
rock standing before your holy altar. God, hear that cry. Break and melt our hearts. Let us start a new life of prayer beyond anything we've known. God, not just by hype, not by emotion, but by the Spirit of God laying hold of us. Spirit of God, lay hold of this congregation. Lay hold of us in Jesus' holy name. I want you to just praise Him. Now, folks, raise your hands and just praise Him. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you is my title. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Now, I want to tell you before I start. <clears throat> the Bible said if you, if, you have, if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. You can't be saved without the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you understand that? We've got to fully understand that all salvation, all changed hearts is the work of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in hearts. So you can't say, I don't know the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you know the Holy Spirit. You've had his work in your heart. So don't excuse yourself. I, I've preached sometimes on the Holy Spirit. Where people said, well, I don't think I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost like you would describe it, Brother Dave, or, or people in your church. So I think I'll just sit back and relax. That's for spirit, so-called spirit-filled people. Well, I want you to know nobody can get away from this word this afternoon because if you're saved, you have the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Was there any advantage to it? Or has it been to no advantage whatsoever? Heavenly Father, you put this simple, simple message on my heart for the body of Jesus Christ here and Broadway and Times Square Church and for those who may hear it on tape. But I pray for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, come upon me now. Give me a sanctified mind, a clean heart, a pure vessel. Let the words flow from your very heart. Let me be just a channel. Lord, we take your authority over every hindering spirit, over everything that would block the mind and the heart from receiving. Lord, I thank you that through prayer you do speak to your servants. You call shepherds, you call pastors, you call evangelists. Lord, you call us to a certain work. and You've called me to a pastoral message today, and I pray, Lord, that in its simplicity it will find its place in our heart. Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we ask for the unction and the anointing that makes the word life-changing. Don't let it fall to the ground, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? I want you to picture with me for a moment that marvelous scene on the Mount of, of uh, Translation when Jesus is taken up into the heavens. <clears throat> now, these disciples who gathered still don't get it. They still don't understand. They're still shocked and surprised that he's not set up his earthly kingdom here on earth. That's what they thought he came to do, to drive the Romans out of Jerusalem and out of Judea, and out of Israel, and set up a kingdom. And they all were going to have a very important place in this kingdom. They're still thinking that way when they stand watching him ready to depart. His closing directions had been to them, tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And you know what they're saying to him? Even though these are his last words, he's about to ascend to the Father and to the glory. And they've just heard that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. And they're still saying, Lord, will thou at this time Restore again the kingdom of Israel. In other words, you are not going to be king. You're not setting up the earthly kingdom, but are you empowering us to do that now? Are we going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be uh, ruler? And they're still thinking, are you setting up your kingdom at this time? They totally missed it. These disciples didn't understand Christ's message that his kingdom was not of this earth. It was a spiritual kingdom. It was set up in the hearts and the minds of individuals, a spiritual kingdom. They're still thinking physical kingdom. They're still thinking Roman soldiers. They're still thinking about taking power and authority in the flesh. Now, Jesus, before he left, gave some wonderful, marvelous promises. Remember, he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I'm giving to you. That's an uh, incredible statement. 
He said, you haven't known the kind of peace that I'm going to bestow upon you now through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my peace, the peace that has maintained me through my ministry here, the peace I've had all my time as incarnate in the flesh. I'm giving it to you now. And then he says, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Wonderful promises. But the most wonderful promise of all is that They were going to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, it's important, it's expedient that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I can only be with a number of you. My kingdom is going to expand. There are going to be millions of you, like the sands of the sea. It's going to be all over the world. I can only be at one place at one time. But it's expedient, it's important that I go. And I am going to take of my spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. I'm going to take of my Spirit so that I am not going to walk with you. I will not be beside you, but I will be in you. I will be with you. You're going to see me again, but you're going to see me in the inner man. I am going to be poured out upon you, and all the resources that I have are going to be in you. You won't have to come and talk to me. You won't have to walk beside me. I am going to be in you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to come and live in your body. I'm going to live in you. Now, Jesus had spent, what, three years with these disciples, and uh, they didn't understand. They were not comprehending. In fact, Jesus says there's many things. If you go to, to John, the 16th chapter, you might just go there and leave it open because I'll be referring to this. Go to John, the 16th chapter, if you will, please. Or the 14th chapter. Sorry, it is the 16th chapter. John 16. 14th is good on the Holy Ghost also. I'll be referring to that. But right now, go to the 16th chapter of John, if you will, please. Now, let's, uh, I just want you to read with me uh, verse begin at verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, look at me, please. This is an amazing statement. Isn't it, isn't it something? Who, who could have been more intimate with Jesus than these disciples? They, they ate with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They slept with him. He taught them many, many things. He, they saw miracles. Uh, he, he told them of the Father. He taught them to pray. Uh, he washed their feet. He told them eternal values and, and He's saying there's so many things I I want you to know, so many things I want to teach you, but you can't grasp them. It's not within your power to understand. No matter what I would tell you, no matter how deep I want to take you, you don't have the capacity to understand. You don't even understand the spiritual kingdom. You're not understanding the rudimental, fundamental truths that I'm trying to get into your heart so that you can carry on my kingdom, my spiritual kingdom. But he said, nevertheless... However, there's something going to happen. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. My Spirit is going to come upon you. Verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath in mind, Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and will show it unto you. Now look at me, please. Jesus, I, I, I really know in my heart why he could leave them now and with such joy leave them on earth and ascend to his Father and to his former glory. He's leaving with great joy. Can you imagine the anticipation, the joy of our Savior as he's going back to the Father? But you see, Jesus knows what these men face. He knows what his church is going to face. He looked down the corridors of time in his, in his holy mind, and he saw the coming persecutions. He saw all the Roman empires that would destroy multitudes of them. 
He saw the viciousness of those who thought they'd be doing God a favor by killing his own disciples. He knew they would be beheaded for the sake of the gospel. They would be slandered and maligned. They would be called the scum of the earth. He knew that they would be crucified upside down. He knew there would be despair. He knew all the crisis and the problems his disciples were facing. Yet he could leave them with great joy and expectancy. Because he knew. He knew that he was leaving. He was sending the Holy Ghost who would have all the resources that they would ever need. All the power, all the glory, all the might that they had. Every resource as if Jesus walked side by side with them, lived in their house, slept with them, walked with them, talked with them. They would have all the resources that were in Christ. He says, all things that the Father hath in mind, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He will have rested in him every resource that is in me. As the son of the living God, these resources are going to be in you. You may not be able, I may not deliver you from being beheaded. You may lose, take the spoiling of your goods, your house, your family may be taken from you. But I am going to have in you such a spirit of grace and such power that you will not fold up. You will not have to give in. You will not have to uh, die in despair because I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace to face any situation, any crisis, financial, physical, spiritual, mental. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. <clears throat> Beloved, the disciples had the law of Moses. They, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the Psalms. They had the prophets. <clears throat> and yet they do not understand. They are not comprehending. They're not grasping. Jesus is saying, and they had Christ who is the living word. And even though they had the living word, they were not comprehending. And, and the Lord seems to say, I'm not going to take you any further than this. There's something more that's needed. Folks, I want to tell you, I want to make a statement and hear it, and hear it well in your inner man. This word, this word of God is a living word, but it cannot be comprehended. It cannot be understood without the work and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has to bring it to life. The Holy Spirit is, is, we, we say the letter killer. That's speaking of the law of Moses. It's not that this scripture is a dead book. This book is full of life. But for you and I to understand it, the life that's in it, to be uh, injected into us, that we be begin to comprehend it, it's because we must have, we need the Holy Ghost to open our eyes. I, I have heard ministers preach sermons that were theologically very correct, the man very serious, the word preached with with uh, fervor and sincerity, and it's very evident the man has done his study and his homework. He's, he's had his theological background. He gets up, and the word sounds good. It's proper, but it doesn't move you. It, 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 I, I said, well, that, that was all right, but it didn't do anything for me. It didn't change me. It didn't stick with me because it was not under the unction. It did not have with it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I have pastors write to me almost weekly. Confessions. One dear, uh, I was going to name the denomination, I won't name it. But this dear pastor wrote to me a loving letter. He, he said, Brother Dave, I feel like I'm just an empty uh, echo in the pulpit. He said, I study, I pray, I seek the Lord, I am sincere. And I get up and the words just seem to fall right down in front of me. There's no light. There's no power. It, it, it doesn't even affect me. I'm just saying words I hear echo out of my mouth. And folks, the reason for that is because the man has not been, he has not been moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has not been under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make that word come to life. Only life produces life. If there's death in me, I can't give you life. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, if I'm not walking and living in the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not receiving the word from the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to change you. It's not going to change anybody. It's going to be the dead ladder. 
we must have the Holy Spirit to understand and even to live the Word of God. Many things they could not understand, but the moment the Holy Ghost came upon them, they understood it. Peter could stand and preach with, with an understanding that just absolutely opened up. Suddenly the lights were turned on. Suddenly he understood what Jesus had been saying all these months that he'd been with him. The understanding was opened. Hallelujah. <coughs> he is the spirit of truth. The scripture said he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, beloved, my message is not complicated at all. I simply want to uh, persuade you this afternoon how very personal the giving of the Holy Spirit is, how very personal it is. <clears throat> Most Christians do not know the Holy Spirit in an intimate, personal way. They talk about being intimate with Jesus, but they do not know what it means to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be intimate with Jesus without the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the intimacy. He's the way maker into the intimacy of Christ. He doesn't speak of himself. He speaks of Christ. He opens Christ. He brings to remembrance everything about Christ. How can you be intimate with Jesus without being very intimate with the Holy Ghost? To, to most Christians, the Holy Ghost is like a cosmic, impersonal atmosphere who wastes around in and out of your life. It's like a perfume, sweet perfume that comes and goes. If you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, he's gone. But he, they, they, they see him, he is a spirit, but they, they, he is also the third person of the Godhead. He has a personality. And he lives in places. And folks, this is the place he lives in our temple. It's called the temple of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Ghost given to you? And to what advantage in your life? Many who claim to be in and of the Spirit have really had no real effect. They live like other people. They, some, they, they have as much wretchedness and miserableness as anyone else on the job. They go to church and they don't understand. They're just as dead as anybody else. And they claim to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I ask you, to what advantage? <clears throat> That's the purpose of my message. It's true that most Christians believe that he's doing a great work in the earth. You know, that he has come to reprove the world, the great big globe. He's come to the planet to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And they're not a Christian anywhere who doesn't believe the Holy Ghost is at work in Manchuria, in little villages, the Holy Ghost is moving in little towns and mountain villages and, and some most innocent uh, little Christians are having great revivals in Manchuria. We believe that God is moving in Afghanistan in those little village churches, in the little hideaways. We believe that the Holy Ghost is working in India and in China, thousands and even millions being converted. We, we believe that he's in Iraq right now. I know the Holy Ghost is in Iraq. If you've just been listening to the news, Saddam's own son, uh, son-in-law, has just escaped, and three other members of that so-called royal family, and they say they escaped because they're going to bring Saddam down. The Holy Ghost just moved in there, blew them out, and God changed. God, the Holy Ghost is in charge of all the kingdoms of the earth. You know that. You know what some people don't understand? Oh, I'm so glad the Lord taught me. Every war, everything that's happening on the globe right now has to do with God's eternal interest with his church. Everything, see, God, God moves nations. He moves presidents. He moves kings just to take care of his little flock. Everything that's happening has to do with God's spirit with his flock. All these world leaders getting together thinking, what are we going to do? And why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? They don't understand why they're doing it. It's all God is moving and manipulating and planning because he's protecting his bride. Every war Every major happening on the face of this earth is the Holy Ghost taking care of his bride.
Now, we, we know that in 1973, there was a lady named Norma McCorvey. She became the symbolic plaintiff in the abortion rights case. Roe versus Wade, remember? She, she was, she was the Jane Roe. Did you see the papers today? She got saved. <laughs> She was walking uh, past the playground, and the playground was empty, and there were three or four swings, and they were just swinging in the wind, and there were no children, and, and, and terror struck her heart. She said, they're killing all the children. No children in the playgrounds. The Spirit of God came on her, and she was led to Christ, and now she's joined the fight against abortion. Amazing. The Holy Ghost. Oh. See how we marvel at the work of the Holy Ghost in the world? Oh, she, Madeline Mary O'Hara. She was the one who successfully drove prayer out of our American schools, president of the uh, Atheist Society of America. But the Holy Ghost, she couldn't keep the Holy Ghost out of her own house. Holy Ghost went in her own house, saved her son, and he's preaching Christ. <laughs> The Holy Ghost moved into the Kremlin, blew the Kremlin away, pulled down the Iron Curtain. Now he's flooding the Russian front and everybody all over Russia. Bibles are pouring in. Our people are over there right now. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We marvel at that. We see in the wonder what the Lord's doing in, in the world. But folks, we are missing the personality, the, the, the very personalness of the Holy Ghost. He was given to you. He was given to me. He was not just given to the world to come as some impersonal spirit to move on nations and peoples. He was given to you. Listen to what the scripture says. How clear the comforter will come unto you. The father will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You will know him. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you. He will show you things to come. I will send him unto you. You. Until you grasp that. The Holy Ghost is at work in the world, but he's mine. He is mine. He's my guide. He's my teacher. He's my comforter. He's in me. In John's revelation, all seven churches of Asia were birthed by the Holy Spirit. They're living in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost speaking through John to the churches of Asia. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to these churches because it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's the Spirit speaking through the pen of John. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit saw in the churches. Loss of first love, a church falling into lethargy, false doctrines creeping in, fornication, all forms of idolatry, seductive Jezebel teachings, adultery, deadness, empty forms of worship, loss of power, spiritual blindness, lukewarmness, loss of communion with Christ, wretchedness, misery. Do you have ears to hear the the Spirit on three occasions says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying? You read all this, but do you stop and hear the inner man? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? He's speaking to us. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He's saying the same thing he's saying to us. I've been sent to every one of these, he was sent to every one of these Asian churches. He was sent to every believer in those Asian churches with all the wisdom, the knowledge, the power, the resources that are in Christ. They were in him. He said, I have been sent to do all things and perform all things as surely as if Christ walked with you on this earth. Why then? Is it, why are God's people leaving their first love? If he has come to lead us into all truth, why is the Laodicean church in such blindness? If he has come to give us the riches of Christ, why are they poor? Why are they wretched? If with the mind of Christ is in us through the Holy Ghost, where is the power? Why is John seeing him, the one who laid his head on his bosom? 
his dear friend, why does he see him now come at walking among the seven candlesticks, which were the seven churches of Asia? And why are his eyes blazing? And why is there a sharp word, a two-edged tongue, a sword pouring out of his mouth, speaking at the church with fire and thunder? And what is he saying? What is he saying? These seductive teachings and the wretchedness and the misery and the poverty. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. What if Jesus had delayed his crucifixion <clears throat> just long enough to minister for three years in these Asian churches? He, he delayed his crucifixion. He delayed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he travels, did Paul, to all these seven churches and he, he gave the living word. He was the word and he expounded to them. And he, he made visit after visit after visit to these seven churches. Would they have been any different? No. The scripture makes it very clear. He would have had to have ended his time with them. And he was saying, there were so many things I wanted to tell you, but you can't grasp them. They needed the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit. But to what advantage? What advantage? They had the Holy Spirit. Why did they end up in such a sad state? Why is there such incredible blindness? Christians so deceived that they thought they were near perfect when they were absolutely deceived. They were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is what the Holy Spirit's wanting to know. That's what he's asking. How is it with all the resources available? How is it? That you can say that you walk and live in the Holy Spirit and you live in such poverty. You walk in such blindness. Here's Jesus saying to the seven churches, he's saying, repent. Or I'll remove your candlestick. In other, I, I'll take away your reason for existence. You won't even be called to church. He says to another, repent or else I'll come unto you quickly, and I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Another, he says, I'll send you into great tribulation. Another, I'll spew out of my mouth. It, did the Spirit speaking through John's pen have a right to speak so sharply to his own Spirit-filled people? Very. Why, why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here in the first three chapters of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Why such grief in the Holy Spirit? Why such threats to his own church? <clears throat> Lovingly, yes. Because even the Laodicean church, you know, when it says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, God wasn't eating his church. Please understand, he wasn't chewing up his church. He's not trying to digest his church. When it says in his mouth means, you know, what comes out of his mouth, two-edged sword, it's the word that is in his mouth. He's talking about people who once were in the word. He said, I'm going to spew you out. There'll be no understanding. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no discernment. He's not sending them to hell. He's not damning his people. But he, what he is saying, because in the next few verses, you say he's knocking at the door. He said, buy of me. He's knocking at the door. He's longing to come in and sup with them. He loves them dearly. There's so many being spewed out of his mouth. They're living without that. That's why so many of these manifestations that are foolish are coming into the church. They've been spewed out of the mouth of God. The two-edged sword is there no longer. They're not walking in the power of the two-edged sword. They're not walking in the spirit of his mouth. Why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here? I kept thinking, God, why are you so grieved? Why is it... it are you speaking so sharply to the church? It's the same reason he has grieved about many of us in this church. I have grieved him in this matter. The Holy Spirit is sharply grieved with some of us sitting here right now hearing me. Here it is. They had all that is in the power of the Holy Spirit available. And they ignored him. They hamstrung him, and they went their own way, seeking their own counsel from crisis to crisis to crisis. 
They endured their blindness. They endured their emptiness. They endured their misery. They went from misery to misery, crisis to crisis, and did not call on the Holy Ghost, did not use him. They abandoned his power. They ignored his power. Very few Christians, when they get in trouble and when they're hard places, run, com- run immediately to the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, I had a picture in my mind coming to church uh, just before this service in my house. I am picture in a big crusade, a great big bowl, 20,000 people or so in this big uh, amphitheater. And there's a great evangelist there who advertises himself a man of power, full of the Holy Ghost and light. And we've got all 20,000 eyes waiting to see the Holy Ghost do something through one man. They're all waiting to see. All on the edge of their seat, excited. Folks, and I'm not putting this down, but they're all looking down there to watch what the Holy Ghost is doing. You know what I saw? I saw the Holy Ghost down here on stage looking up at 20,000 people, watching to see, well, what are they going to do now? Uh, are they going to tomorrow see it's just as important that I help them in their argument with their boss? And when they're leaving the house in the morning and things are all wrong, they turn to me and get grace and power for the day. Where are the 20,000 miracles on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday out there? They're looking at this one man, the Holy Ghost, looking at 20,000 people saying, I want to not hear one man. Folks, it's not enough to come and say, that was a Holy Ghost meeting. What about a Holy Ghost wake up in the morning? What about a Holy Ghost subway ride? What about a Holy Ghost lunch? What about a Holy Ghost coming home, take your wife in your arms, and a Holy Ghost kiss? And the Holy Ghost moving all day long. What's wrong with that? Why else would such an ed- educated prosperous, gifted churches in Laodicea end up with so many rich and miserable, poor, blind, naked believers. How could it be but that they had ignored and not consulted and not appropriated the great power in the ministry of the Holy Ghost? And folks, that is what grieves the Holy Spirit today about you and me. That, that, that we do not appropriate this power. We're, we're looking for counselors. Some of you people are still paying $100, 200 dollars $500,000, getting on TWA, going here, going there to get a word from somebody. Somebody lay you down and pop you. I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, when are you going to depend on the Holy Ghost yourself and not look for some man? We've got a problem in the church, folks. It's a big problem. We've got an ironclad covenant of the Holy Ghost that he has come to abide. He doesn't flit in and out. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We may make him grieve. We may make him weep. But he said, I'm with you. I am with you till you die. I'm with you. I will minister to you. I'll minister to you. I'm available. Call upon me. But why so many so-called spirit-filled Christians walking in utter confusion. Do you know what pastors tell me? That, 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 uh, that there, there are people are coming to them and saying, what's happening? We, we don't understand what's happening in all these manifestations. There's such confusion in the churches today. Thousands of Christians confused. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. You know what's wrong with that whole scene? Is that they have not been shut in with the Holy Ghost They don't believe that He is their guide, that He will guide them, He will teach them, He will show them. If they'll just spend quality time with Him, they'll know it in the inner man. Nobody has to tell them. The Holy Ghost will tell you. It's not enough to say I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I can speak with tongues and I can prophesy. I want to hear somebody say, I appropriate Him. I use Him. I use him in my everyday life. I use him every time I get upset. (laughs) 
I was just about to tell you how Brother Carter had to use him. When his wife came home and he painted the wrong color in the kitchen. <laughs> I've never seen you so red in my life. How about that color, red? There, there. There's not a Christian here in this house this afternoon who, who would not readily acknowledge, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I believe He's my guide. I believe He's my friend. He's my comforter. Folks, that's lip service. We can say that so glibly. And then when we get into a hard place, we are slandered. We have a crisis financially or something else happens. We go to anybody, we run to anybody, we're in a panic. We don't know the rest that remains for the children of God. And I'm telling you, only the Holy Ghost, only relying on the Holy Ghost can bring you into that rest. Why was he given? To what advantage? That in these crises. Now let me tell you, uh, before I close, I'm not going to preach much longer, but I've got to get to this. I want to talk to you about who grieves the Holy Ghost the most. It's not the mugger. Not the man on the street. It's not the lukewarm Christian. It's not the dead Christian. The one who wounds the Holy Spirit and grieves him the most <clears throat> is the one who has known how to walk in the Holy Spirit and have, through, through exercise, practice, have utilized the Holy Spirit, have found him faithful for years. They have taught the Holy Spirit. They know the Holy Spirit. He said, he's been in, you will know him. And they have known him. They have walked with him. <clears throat> but there comes one battle too much. <clears throat> one slander too vicious. One battle too overpowering. And a weariness sets in. And up to this point, God could point to this man or this woman to, and say to the devil, just like he did for Job, look at Brother Dave, or, or look at Sister McIntyre, look at Brother Brown, whatever the name may be. Look, you see, when they get in trouble, when they're in a crisis, when things go wrong, they immediately run to the Holy Spirit. They immediately draw on His inner strength. They begin to commune with the Holy Ghost. I worked with Sister Catherine Cohen for five years in the car, on the elevator, in, in the restaurants. She was always talking. Half the time, not to me. <laughs> and my wife, she's talking to the Holy Ghost. She's talking to him all the time and not some silly talk. Holy Ghost is not some silly personality. I tell you what he's going to talk to you most about how to grow in Jesus. He's going to tell you how to grow up. He's going to reveal. He show you things to come about things to come in your life about revelation. How he's going to open up your mind and till till finally the greatest joy in your life is not getting uh, winning some lottery somewhere. You shouldn't be. You win a lottery. I'll tell you one thing. <clears throat> I was going to say, don't give it here to the church. <laughs> I'm saying now because we've got Christians playing numbers and lottery. It, that's gambling. It's out and out gambling. Now you take that for what it's worth, but <clears throat> probably not going to be worth anything to you because you wouldn't win it anyhow. The Lord will see to that. you see there, there, there's a place in the Holy Spirit where you're finally your greatest joy is a revelation of Christ. Something, something sweeter, something more powerful. He opens the word to you. You see things you've never seen before. That becomes more important than money, clothes, cars, human love, anything else. I tell you now, 
I, I know it. I, I can say it before a holy God. My wife can vouch for this. The greatest joy in my life when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals something fresh about the heart of Jesus. I get ecstasy. I get excited. You can have my car. You can have my... Now, don't take me serious, but... <clears throat> Somebody going to come claim the car. Spiritually speaking. <laughs> How many know what I mean? You, you say, Holy Spirit... I know you're my guide and I need direction and he will. If you just seek him, it'll come. Isn't it's not going to come? He's not going to send you a fortune cookie with it inside. It's, it's going to come. It's going to come to you in ordinary ways sometimes. He just block a path here, block a path, and suddenly the only doors left is the right one and that's the only goes leading you. He will lead you in practical ways, but oh, you finally come to this place. <clears throat> The real advantage of the Holy Spirit in being intimate with Him is that I'm allowing Him to do what He's been sent to do. And that's all that it means to walk in the Spirit. Let Him do what He's been sent to do. To lead me into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, it puts a change in your countenance. It, it puts joy in your heart. And you know you can have that on your job. You don't have to be a preacher. He wants that for every one of us. He, he wants you to be able, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He's going to show you things about the coming of the Lord. He's going to show you, we're going to see a lot of that tonight, about the coming of the Lord and what he's going to show us. All, he shall glorify me. You can be on a job and he'll glorify you right through the, the word and the revelation. He receive it mine and he'll show it unto you. And Brother Carter was talking about taking a little Bible into to a little cubby hole somewhere on the job and reading it and somebody going to hear a screech and a scream. You know what it is? God spoke to you a revelation. You come out of there smiling and everybody says, well, they won the lottery. They won the $300 ticket. Uh, something wonderful has happened. No revelation of the Holy Spirit has come. Revelation, walking and living and moving in the revelation of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to preach it. It's something that you get from your own heart and you ponder it. You don't go around boasting about it, but it's bringing life to your spirit, bringing life to your body and your soul. Hallelujah. Well, I better quit. <laughs> to what advantage? the Holy Spirit that has been given to you. Are you leaning on Him? Oh, folks, I talk to Him every waking hour. Wake up in the middle of the night, I talk to Him. Now I'm in trouble, I call on Him. Where is He? He's not out there. In China, so busy, He doesn't have any power and time for you. No, 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 no. He can take care of the whole world and still count every hair on your head. If you're bald, every follicle, he can, he can do it. His thoughts are so many towards you, you can't comprehend them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you have the Holy Ghost? Let's stand. Hallelujah. How many of you fellows from Timothy House know you can walk every single day in the power of the Holy Ghost? Direction, anointing, comfort, strength, power, everything you need is in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this church. You are welcome in this vessel. This is your temple. This is your body. Lord, we've got to start showing the advantage of our walk with you. There has to be an advantage. You were given, Lord, to meet every need. Oh, meet every need here. Holy Spirit, meet every need. Hallelujah. Lord, for those that are hungry, Holy Ghost has enough food to fill every hungry spot. 
He can fill every belly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every sadness you can drive away and restore gladness. Oh, God, for every wretchedness, every blind eye, you can open them. You can give wisdom and knowledge and truth. It's all in you. Hallelujah. All that is in Christ has been deposited in the Holy Spirit and deposited into our very physical bodies. Not just our spiritual mind, but into our physical bodies. So that we can be ruled and reigned and directed by the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, I want you to have your... I want you to just raise your hands and thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank Him for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. This is the conclusion of the message.